the wheel of consent is a practice. It doesn't replace your love life. It doesn't mean that every interaction in your life should be taken apart so that one is giving so that the other is receiving. And it doesn't mean that all sex is about taking turns. And it certainly doesn't mean that all touch is about sex. In fact, the wheel of consent is not about sex at all. It just happens to affect your sex once you, once you understand it. I'm Cindy Darnell. Welcome to The Erotic Philosopher, the podcast where we examine and explore sex and relationships through social, personal, cultural, scientific, political, and other lenses, and unpack and explore your erotic quandaries with the world's wisest erotic philosophers. Today on The Erotic Philosopher, I am thrilled to introduce you to Dr. Betty Martin. Dr. Martin has had her hands on people professionally for over 40 years, first as a chiropractor and upon retiring from that as a certified surrogate partner, a sacred intimate and a somatic sex educator. Her explorations in somatic based therapy and such practices informed her creation of the framework now known as the Wheel of Consent. Enjoy today's powerful discussion with Dr. Betty Martin. Betty Martin, it's so wonderful to see you and welcome to The Erotic Philosopher. Thank you. Great to see you again. remember meeting in front of that little cafe in, in uh, Brisbane, I think. It was Melbourne. and it Melbourne. Was quite, it was some years ago. Some years ago. It, maybe six or seven years ago uh, when I met you when you were out there touring with uh, one of your programs like a pro. But before we get into any of that, Betty, as I introduce you to the erotic philosopher audience, what is it that you would like people to know about you who've never met you before? Oh, goodness. Um, well, I'm a former, I'm a retired chiropractor. I had my hands on people for 30 some years. And then I retired from that practice and started working as a sacred intimate sex coach, sex worker. And um, and I loved both of those professions, quite different, but I loved them both. And during the course of my work doing sex work, I I noticed certain dynamics which have which have become the wheel of consent. And um, and that's what I'm known for these days that certainly is what you're known for and and the wheel of consent is i think the most comprehensive model of understanding consent that i have ever seen and the fact that it was created by you you know from the ground up and i'm what i mean by that is that it was a somatically inspired thing it wasn't something that was created by academics in universities not that there's anything wrong with academics in universities but that's not where this comes from and i think that that is possibly why it is so incredibly effective and so before we sort of go into it uh, anymore when people are thinking, what on earth is this wheel? What are they talking about? <laughs> what the heck is that? <laughs> Could you, Betty, in your own words, describe, so we know that it came out of your somatic work, your chiropractic work, your sexuality work, your hands-on work. Could you describe sort of the moments, what the model is, first of all, and then how it came to pass that you started to realise how incredibly useful and powerful this was? Mm, that's a great question. I, actually, I'm going to kind of reverse those because how I came, you're right, it came out of being in the room hands-on with many, 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 many people. And um, I took a workshop years ago with the Body Electric School, and we learned a game there among many other things, called the three-minute game. And the three-minute, it was developed by Harry Faddis. The three-minute game is two people asking each other two questions and taking turns. And those questions are, what do you want me to do to you for three minutes? 
Well, I can think of some fun <laughs> things you did in for three minutes. <laughs> and then you answer and you negotiate and you come up with what you're going to do and you do it for three minutes. And the second question is, what do you want to do to me for three minutes? Well, I can think of some fun things I'd like to do to you for three minutes too. So, so it's, what do you want that, all right, let me back up. So it's, what do you want me to do to you? And what do you want to do to me? So, and again, you negotiate and you come up with whatever you're going to do and you do it. And what you notice if there's two of you asking those two questions that you end up with four rounds of the game. So either I'm doing what you want or I'm doing what I want. And there's quite a difference between those two. An enormous enormous difference. difference. And then and the other two, you're doing what you want or you're doing what I want. So it, it creates this di- this two different dynamics, four different roles. And I started using that with clients and I would ask them, I, I started out with what do you want me to do to you? And I gradually narrowed it for what I was teaching to how do you want me to touch you? And how do you want to touch me? Because it fit my work better. Right. And I think that language also really lends itself to it being a more collaborative, co-creative thing rather than something that somebody does to you. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can play it with it either way. Right. Um, so what I noticed was when I would ask new clients how we we do the talking and the history and the you know all that stuff, and then I'd ask them how do you want me to touch you for a few minutes right now as sort of a get acquainted kind of touch. And they would, their faces would go blank. I have no idea. No one's ever asked me that. Oh, whatever you want is fine. Or I don't have any idea what I want. How, what should I want? What am I supposed to want? And it showed me that over and over and over, it showed me that, wait a minute, people are kind of lost here. Like, we, we don't, someone offers to do what we want and we think we, we, we can't think of it or um, how do you want me to touch you? Well, however you want to touch me is okay, which may be true, but it doesn't answer that question. That's a different question. So when, when you ask people what they want and then they answer with, well, I don't mind this particularly, you could do this if you want. Well, that's not what I asked, but it showed that the, the, the kind of glitch in our minds that, you know, we have an opportunity to have what we want and we settle for what we think is okay. Yes. And that part of the settling, I think, is so incredibly profound that when we can start talking about touch and certainly touch that is based in pleasure, if that is our incentive, because there's obviously lots of reasons people touch each other with pleasure is not always the main one, but it's one of the ones that that tends to be up there for a lot of people. And even still, even though we kind of pay lip service to the notion of pleasure, few of us are willing to, you know, to lay our money down and say, actually, this is, this is really what's going to give me pleasure, whether it's pleasure in the sense of a therapeutic massage or pleasure in in the sense of this is going to turn me on erotically, or pleasure in the sense of this is going to produce an orgasm for me. Few of us are comfortable with discussing touch at that level. Why do you think that is? Oh, Lordy. I mean, I think it's because we have learned, I mean, as infants, we do know how to ask for what we want. That's kind of all we do. Let's ask for what we want. And somewhere in growing up, we start to learn that that's not safe to do that. Shame on you for asking for that. You shouldn't want that. You don't really want that. Um, You know, everything that you ask for is just a problematic. And so, or you don't really know what you want or who, I don't care what you want. 
I mean, all those kinds of things, we learn pretty early not to ask for what we want. And to some degree, we learn to not want or to not know what we want. And I I think it's pretty universal. Um, Yeah. I think so too. And I know, you know, when I first started doing, you know, sex therapy work and particularly working with women and vulva owners around, uh, and this is not exclusively to that cohort necessarily, but it certainly does, is very well represented among them, that they often really don't know what they want and they, they, they find it very hard. And, you know, you can tease it out of them, but it's not like it's being withheld deliberately, like they're playing this coquettish kind of, oh, I don't know what I want. They genuinely don't know. And there's a bunch of reasons for that, I think, including the fact that, um, you know, erotic pleasure, for example, has deliberately been obscured and hidden from women up until probably the last 15 or 20 years. But even still, the the stigma and the shame of a woman who was saying, you know, touch me like this, fuck me like that, is is still, you know, it's still very abrasive to a lot of people's ears, you know, in certain sectors of the community. So, um, you know, so here you are, Betty, you're doing hands-on client-based work, either chiropractic or more sensual and erotic in nature, and you're working with clients who are saying to you, uh, just do whatever you want. How do you go from there to this phenomenally intricate wheel of consent? Oof. Well, um, back to your your previous question and how it developed and what it is. When I saw, when I kept that, it, it came out of asking hundreds of people those two questions. How do you want me to touch you? How do you want to touch me? And seeing all the places that they got lost or got stuck or couldn't understand the question or got confused. Or once we started, they would feel guilty because they're enjoying something. So it just, whatever stuff you have around touch and pleasure, it's going to come up in one of those questions or the other. It's just, it's going to cover everything. Um, And so at some point I noticed, oh, wait a minute, these are four different things and they fit together because I'm kind of an engineer at heart. So they they fit together in a, with the cross and axis, and um, and then I realized oh two of them are about who's doing, and two of them are about who it's for, but it's not the same two. So that's where the wheel of consent. And if you download it, which you can do, you put the link there. I'm going to put the link. There. You can yeah. see that there's. There's four different quadrants created by these two axes. And so in two of them, you're doing, in two of them, you're done to. And in two of them, it's for you. And in two of them, it's for the other person. So because I'm asking you what you want, and then you're asking me what I want. And so it's going to be for you or for me. And then I, then I began to realize, oh, this is a practice. It's a practice in taking, receiving, and giving a part so that you're doing only one of them at a time. It's either for you, it's all about you, your pleasure comes first. You still respect the other person's boundaries, of course, but it's all about you. Or you put your desires on the shelf and it's all about the other person. You still respect your boundaries. But what your preference is doesn't matter for the moment. And so, and it turns out that when you can take them apart, you find out what they are. And you have have experiences that are possible no other way. When it's all for me and you're giving me this gift, you're either giving me the gift of how you're touching me Or you're giving me the gift of your body allowing me to touch you the way I want. Either of both of those are gifts, very different kinds of gifts, but they're both gifts. And it's for me. 
And it breaks my heart open because it's for me. Like you care enough about me to give me this gift. And only when I stop trying to give back to you at the same time, only then can I really take this gift into my heart. And it breaks your heart open. And, and there's, you know, like erotic massage, for example, um, there's experiences you can have that way that you will never have when you're mutually playing and making out and rolling around. Like it just doesn't, it's just a different thing. And so um, a lot of people feel like, a lot of people will say, oh, but I receive by giving. And if I give you a pleasure, then that gives me pleasure. And that's true. It may be pleasurable, but it's not for you. It's not for you. And I think that that is the thing, you know, this notion of, of giving and receiving pleasure, for example, that a, a lot of people seem to have these preconceived ideas of, you know, for example, uh, oral sex is con is considered to be a pleasurable act. It's not necessarily received as a pleasurable act, nor is it uh, uh, given uh, yeah, it as depends a pleasurable on who act. It's for. Right, exactly. <laughs> and and then people will talk about, you know, I want to give you pleasure, but there's no sort of implication around you know, is the thing that I'm giving you even pleasurable to you? It's just, it is the, the implied that because it's oral sex and therefore everybody likes it, the, the, the person who's doing it is going to be, uh, you know, in the giving role and the person who is on the receiving end of it is going to be the recipient of the gift, even though for a lot of people with penises and vulvas, they don't especially like it, but they tolerate it. You know, and to use your language, you know, they allow it. Um, but then who's it for? Right, yeah. right. And then we can end up in situations where there are couples where the person who's doing the doing and the person who's doing the receiving and neither want the one who's doing it doesn't want to be doing it. The one who's receiving it doesn't want to be receiving it. And they can go on like that for 20 years. Yes, Exactly. And whenever I tell that little story in a workshop, everybody nods their heads like, yeah, you know, I've been there. I, you know, I, I'm doing this because I thought you liked it. No, I, I we're doing it because I thought you liked it. And neither of us like it. But yes, it can go on for 20 years. It really oh can. I mean, I've worked, I've worked with couples for whom their sex life has been a version of that story for, you know, 20 or so years and more. And, you know, I think you know, when I first heard about your model and I and I understood it and I, you know, I started practicing it myself and I thought this is one of the most single most revolutionary tools I have ever encountered as a sex therapist. And I mean from the clinical stuff that I studied at university through to all of the various somatic and hands-on practices, this has profoundly changed the way I think about sex, the way I do it, the way I teach about it, the way I talk about it with other people, you know, my own in my private life and in my professional life. When you started to wake up to the magic of what you had created, and because I do think it is that revolutionary, people are going to be talking about this in 500 years from now and referring to the moment that sex changed forever. That's how important I think this work is to the field. I'm serious. I think it's phenomenal. When you started, you know, being able to decipher the, the distinction between the giving and the receiving and who's doing what to whom and where is the gift going and all of this stuff that for folks listening, thinking, what is this? You need to go and watch Betty's videos. We're not going to rehash it here, but you do need to go and watch them to be able to follow this conversation. Um, when the lights started coming on for you, what was that like? How did it feel to think... <laughs> Why am I why am I seeing this thing that no one else has ever seen before? That's a you know? great question. <laughs> I you know, it was pretty gradual. Um it's like a dimmer switch because I it was the first time I played the game at this workshop, it was obvious that there were four different four different rounds. That was obvious. And then I was trying to explain it to someone. I said, "It's like this." And I drew it these two axes. And I thought, 
oh my gosh, isn't that cool? And then I showed it to a couple of other people. And I was so excited. You know, you you just like blip all over somebody and their eyes glaze over and they're like, what? You know, I didn't get it. And um, plus I had a partner at the time who didn't really like it. And so that slowed me down. Didn't like the model or didn't didn't like, didn't like the model, didn't like the game, didn't like taking turns. Um, it, there were reasons for it. But anyway, so so I didn't. I didn't, I thought, oh, there's this cool little thing. I'll just share it with a few people. And it's kind of a glitch in the way my brain works. And so I started sharing it with other people. I, I was teaching a, a two-day class at that time for sex workers on boundaries and, and professional edges. And, and the wheel of consent took about an hour and a half on Saturday afternoon. And it was kind of cool. People kind of got it. And then as I, I gradually learned how to teach it, which was that it needs to be experiential. I mean, you can watch the videos and they're kind of cool, but when your hands feel the difference, is it for me or is it for you? When your hands feel the difference, suddenly it all becomes very clear. And so then I started teaching it more and I gradually noticed that, oh, this, this seems to be useful for people. And I uh, was in Australia actually teaching and, um, and some year or so later, I got an email from someone who'd been in one of my classes and he said, oh, I'm really using your stuff. It's really great. Here it is on my website. And I went to his website. And it wasn't it. It was four things, but it was like that. It's like you, you didn't get it. <laughs> it was it was four things, but he just you know didn't like. And I was in the meantime, I was writing a book on it, and the book was taking a long time. And I thought, as well, <laughs> thank you, as books do. And I thought, well, I'll just take a few weeks and I'll put up some videos so people will have something to start with. And that turned into nine months of learning how to take video in my living room. Um, but once those videos were up on the web on my website, uh, I was kind of shy to put them out. So I just sent them to a few people, you know, and suddenly I was getting emails from all over the world saying, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. This is so helpful, blah, 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 blah. And so it turned out that posting those free videos was really helpful and that who knew it was really useful for people. And so I just have, it's just, and even now in, you know, 15 years, even now, sometimes people will write and say how amazing it's changed this, that, and the other for them. And I'll go, wow, really? That's cool. You know, because yeah. It is truly, truly revolutionary. And, and, you know, for people perhaps who, you know, they watch the videos once, twice, as you say, and they don't get it, or they even take a class and they still don't get it. it it's because I think anyway, and I'd like to hear what you uh, experience, but it flies in the face of everything that we have been taught implicitly, not explicitly, implicitly about sex, that whole thing of you know, that sex has to be, you know, mutual, it has to be, you know, magical, it has to be uh, when you're with the right person, it all just flows effortlessly and you fit together like little jigsaw puzzle pieces and, and you just know by giving them a look and all this kind of stuff. And that's not to say that sex can't be like that. Sometimes it can be like that on the very rare occasions where it, it just magically aligns and it, and that that does and can happen for sure. But in the vast majority of cases, I would say 98.5% of the time, it's not like that. And one person is often white knuckling their way through. That doesn't mean that they're hating it. That doesn't mean that they are in pain. That doesn't mean that they're being assaulted. It just means that it's not entirely to their liking. And so this option that you propose of taking turns as opposed to this, you know, I, I guess a very heteronormative fantasy of it has to be mutual and it has to be, you know, which is what you see in Disney and what you see in porn, frankly, 
that, that that's where we get these implicit ideas. And you're saying, no, no, let's not let's not do Disney sex and porn sex. Let's actually break down who who's doing what to whom. But the big question is, who is it for? That is so revolutionary. And then there are going to be people listening who perhaps like your ex partner, like mm, no, not interested. What do we do with those? Well, I think it's it's really the wheel of consent is a practice. It doesn't replace your life. It doesn't replace your love life. It doesn't mean that every interaction in your life should be taken apart so that one is giving so that and the other is receiving. How could you even take a walk and have a conversation with your friend if that was the case? Like, it doesn't mean that. And it doesn't mean that all sex is about taking turns. And it certainly doesn't mean that all touch is about sex. In fact, the wheel of consent is not about sex at all. It just happens to affect your sex once you once you understand it. So it's a practice in taking them apart. Most of our lives, we don't want to take them apart, which is great. But when you learn how to take them apart, you start to notice how many times in your life you kind of feel like you're giving and you don't really want to give. Or how many times in your life you're wanting the other person to do something for you, but you don't ask. Or you're wanting access to the other person, but you don't ask. Or you start, so once you learn how to take them apart, you'll notice all the places in your life where you're not really clear that you really did want this gift. You just didn't want to ask for it. Or you really feel like you're giving here, even though you didn't ask them if they wanted it, you know? So, so as far as how it plays out in sex, I think how it plays out in sex is that your antennas get real clear about who is it for. And then you are not interested in this mucking about where nobody really gets what they want. And you gain the skill to communicate about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. And I think, you know, for people who have taken your uh, workshop like a pro, which we'll talk about in just a second, it's, you know, once you know these things, once you approach sex with this very advanced level of, of somatic knowledge, of pleasure knowledge, I would suggest i would argue it's it's impossible to unknow it you can it, it will it will change the way you have sex forever like, and that's what i mean about this being so incredibly revolutionary because like no other practice that i have learned from all of the teachers that i've had and they've all been you know wonderful like nothing else has it changed the way i think about sex this that, that it's just you know, extraordinary. You become haunted by this question, who is this for? And you start asking that in all these different things that you're doing in your life. And it it it's um yeah, it'll just start to haunt you. <laughs> right. You know, and it completely blasts out of the water, especially now that we're sort of in this, you know, slightly post post me too era where, you know, everybody knows the word consent and not everybody knows really what it means, but we've all heard the word. Um, and, you know, some people are sort of walking on broken glass because they're like, oh, what about consent and all of this stuff? And, you know, good. We're in, we're in a pivotal time of social change. That's fine. And then this model comes along really at the right time, even though obviously it predates me too, but it, it just sort of, it all just coincided at the right time that that the whole movement happened. You were just there waiting in the wings and then bang, you came out the Trying door. To and, the damn book. <laughs> and then here it is. And now we have a, a much more robust and comprehensive understanding of consent that it's not just, you know, hey, do you want to have sex? Okay. Well, that's consent, you know, that, that that doesn't really even, you know, touch the sides, as it were. Um, and so let's talk about uh, your your workshops like a pro. Are they running now that we're, we're not really post-COVID yet? We maybe have almost? started them again. We took a couple of years off, of course. Um, and during that time, we developed an online version, which is amazingly pretty good. Yeah. Um, and like a pro is a five-day training for practitioners. 
So that's broadly defined. We have massage therapists, physical therapists, um, sex workers, physicians, um, counselors, coaches, therapists, psychotherapists, all kinds. So if you're if you're working with people, this is probably useful. So it's five days, and we that that expanded from that hour and a half on Saturday afternoon that it started being. I I just gradually noticed that. Wait a minute, this is the important part. Oh, wait a minute, there's you know there's this is more needed here. Um, so the first three days we spend on you so that you have an experience of each of the four quadrants in your body because you have to get it somatically before it makes really much sense. And when, when your hands get it, you get it. It's like, Oh, okay. I get it now. Um, it's definitely a doing thing. It's a yeah. doing thing. So we do that for three days. And then the last two days we talk about how it fits into your practice with your clients. And, and so, yeah. And I would encourage people who are listening who may think, well, you know, I don't do touch-based work. I just do talk-based work. I would say do it anyway. The, no, no, ab- absolutely. It, yeah, absolutely. It revolutionizes. It revolutionizes, like I said, the way you think about sex. It just it, it gets into every little corner of our of our minds, of our bodies, and, and transforms our our relationship to 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 touch. And and that that's it, it's just so incredibly important. So you know, there you've been doing this, you know, expanding the model for fifteen years. You've got videos, you've got online courses, and now you have a book. It took you a long time to write the book, and now the book is out. Years. How does it How does it feel now being on top of you know everything else that you've done? That now that you're an author, hey, <laughs> it's such a relief. I can't tell you. It did take a long time, and it was uh, it was very difficult. It was it was difficult, far out of proportion to the actual task. It was difficult emotionally for lots of reasons, which I don't need to talk about. But um, yeah, so it's done. It came out a a year ago now. And um, the art of receiving and giving. And it it walks you through each of the the steps, the processes. And then it gives some theory and explanation. But it's really, it's a how-to. It's a, here's what you can do to experience each of these four quadrants. So it's about the practice. And the reviews online are, you know, oh, stellar, unsurprisingly. Um, what have the responses been like to you about the book? Um, very appreciative. It's kind of like the the responses to getting those free videos up. It's like emails saying, oh, my gosh, I've waited for this. I didn't know this was possible. Oh, my gosh. This has completely changed my relationship. This has saved our relationship. This makes so much sense. Um, thank you for doing this. You know, lots of appreciation. And, yeah, I think, again, like it, it, it's it's just wonderful to be able to have access to this now, you know, in the form of the videos. Now you have online courses, which is going to make your work really accessible to people who can't travel for, you know, all of the reasons that we're living with right now. Um, and also book format. So for people who want to get this information now, you really can access it in all of the different learning styles, whether you're a reading person, an auditory person, visual person, or a somatic person, you can do the lot. You can see the um, the courses at schoolofconsent.org. So all of those links I'm going to put in the show notes for people to be able to follow up with you because, again, I really encourage every single person listening to this to, <laughs> to bow down at your feet, quite frankly, and I know I keep <laughs> banging on about it, but... Um, <laughs> I don't throw That's these compliments kind of around like, no, I really mean it, Betty. I think, I, I just think that your contribution to the field of sexology is is one of the greatest of, of our era. It's it's just phenomenal. And I, I'm honoured to be an associate and an acquaintance of yours. I really, Thank really you. love it. Betty, what's next for you? Where do you go from here? Or is it just... Uh, you know, knitting and watching the sunset from here on out. <laughs> well, no, I'm still teaching because I love to teach. 
and um, I'm teaching a couple times this coming year. And other, and I, we've trained other teachers to teach, and we're we're training more people. Um, and we're working an audio book right now. I'm not reading it; uh, someone else is reading it. Um, you've had enough of me. If you if you want more of me, go to see YouTube. <laughs> Yeah, I I actually look forward to being able to think about something besides the wheel. You know, I, I there are other interesting topics out there worthy of thought and discussion, and I'd like to explore some of them. Yeah. Which yeah. topics are, are tickling you right now? Well, topics tickling me are um <laughs> The coming complete social collapse due to climate change, which is not a fun topic, but it's really interesting to me how we can, uh, given that it's coming, it's too late to stop it, um, it appears, but you, you could argue with that, I guess. No, I'm not going to argue with it. I just noticed the somatic response I had in my belly. I just like in an elevator, it just dropped yeah. right down. Like, oh, yeah. Gosh. If it if it's too late to stop, then what can we do to mitigate and to enrich our relationships with each other and become more compassionate and connected in the middle of it? It's like if, if the ship's going down, then how can we hold each other better while it goes down? And how can we make sure that people are fed? How can we make sure that people are housed? You know, which as a world, we're not doing that well to no, begin with. No, we're really not. And, you know, I, I notice in myself what that brings up for me as I hear you say that is you know, the vast majority of us have spent two years pretty much in our homes in some capacity or other. And that while the world seemingly has changed in terms of our, the way we socialize and the way we connect with each other, even physically, what we are left with is the repercussions of this through, you know, economic lenses, but also social lenses that some of us are far more isolated than we want to be. Some of us have been thriving in the isolation and others have really been struggling. And then we add on top of that the, the you know, the climate crisis, if we call it a crisis, I think it deserves a title. Um, and that it, it certainly in my lifetime, I can't speak for the history of humanity, but it feels like it is a time of reckoning and I do wonder whether or not we uh, collectively do we have the skills to pull ourselves through this and you know it's it's going to be people like you uh maybe me who who teach people how to be with the discomfort of you know the legacy that we've inherited over generations of of really not paying attention to the stuff that matters like our environment and our hearts that they have been systematically ignored for generations and generations and now we're facing this is what happens when you ignore the stuff that matters. If <laughs> you ignore the stuff that matters, <laughs> that is really true. That's really true. Uh, well, Betty, I look forward to uh, whatever you create next because your mind is incredible and oh, your compassion you. is <laughs> Really, it's true. Your mind is incredible. Your compassion is, you know, I imagine what drives so much of this. Your incredible generosity giving away those videos for free, you know, you really didn't have to. Um, people would have paid for them, but they're free. And that is the, one of the greatest acts of service I've ever seen. And, again, folks, the links are in the show notes i really encourage you to sign up to get better betty's newsletter consider taking the workshop certainly get the book and watch the videos and uh reach out send betty some fan mail <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Betty oh, Mon, it's you. a That's delight, an absolute delight. And yeah, I look great forward to, to catching again. up with you another time. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. I hope you enjoyed today's discussion with Dr. Betty Martin and have a much richer understanding of really how consent is is far more nuanced than most of us comprehend and that when we're looking at it through the lens of working with young people and adults of all ages and all orientations and all descriptions and also I think this extends you know beyond sex even it, it extends into our lives the way we are coerced and cajoled into agreeing to a lot of different things in business in personal life professionally all kinds of areas of our lives where we are sort of just ushered into things that we don't necessarily want to do it's very hard to understand how a consent-based culture could actually be part of our normal lives given that so many parts of our lives not just sex are really not immersed in consent not immersed in permission oriented and even pleasure oriented practices something to think about and you know as always on the erotic philosopher i love having you here and i love you loaning me your ears each time we get together. If you're enjoying The Erotic Philosopher, I would love it if you would show a little bit of extra support to us by leaving us a rating and a review on iTunes. You can do that, obviously, by accessing iTunes. And if you're not listening on iTunes, if you're listening on another platform, you can head over to my website, cindydarnell.com, C-Y-N-D-I-D-A-R-N-E-L-L.com. It's the home of the Erotic Philosopher. You'll find the podcast tab there. You will also find the link there to iTunes to leave your rating and review. Your ratings and reviews help other people just like you find our podcast. It's with those ratings and reviews that boost our visibility to new listeners. While you're there on my website, check out my online pleasure school. You'll find something there for everybody. There are courses pre-recorded, ready to go, that you can take in the privacy of your own home. You may also like to consider working with me, counseling, coaching, and therapy, helping you solve your personal sex and relationship quandaries. And of course, you can follow us on social media. We are at The Erotic Philos, that's P-H-I-L-O-S, on Instagram and Twitter. And you can follow me, Cindy Darnell, at C-Y-N-D-I underscore D-A-R-N-E-L-L, also on Instagram and Twitter. It's wonderful having you here, and I look forward to joining you next time. Thanks for listening.